The Believer's Walk of Faith is paid for by Bill Winston Ministries partners and viewers. Up next on The Believer's Walk of Faith. The anointing abides in you. Once you get saved, born again, baptized in water and filled with the Holy Ghost, it's on you. You don't be trying to... uh, 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 and try, trying to feel something. Oh, can't you feel the pastor? No. No, I can't. No, you got it. Sitting in that chair, looking at me. You got what I got. Watch this. And we've got what Jesus has. The anointing abides in you. And whatever you do should what? Should prosper. Say amen to this. So I'm saying, Jesus is saying, wait a minute, the same thing that was on me is on you. And so this anointing, by even using this anointing, this anointing will grow in terms of its intensity. And, but it comes by you. Somebody's got to use it. Now, this anointing must flow through you. So what we did is went to 1 Corinthians in chapter um, 1. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we saw here where um, this, the chosen of God, why he chooses the one he chooses. Look at verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the what? Foolish things of the world to confound the wise and the God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised has God chosen, yea, the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are. Why? So that no flesh, come on, help me now, show glory in his presence. So what am I saying here? God is choosing people who are not people who self-acclaim themselves as strong. In other words, they are people who God can work with who has made room for his strength to work through them. And through it, they'll never be defeated. So he has chosen to use the weak, glory to God, things of the world to manifest his mighty strength. Isn't that good? Now, if you look over to 2 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you'll see here with Apostle Paul, verse 7, he said, lest I should be exalted above the uh, measure through the abundance of revelations, There was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now, it didn't come from God. It came from the devil. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, that's buffet. That's not buffet. Uh, Buffet me. Okay. Verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that I might depart, that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my what? My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in thy weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Infirmities there does not mean sickness or disease. It means weakness. Infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now let's look at verse 9 in the CEV translation and just see what it says. Look what it says here. But he replied, my gift of 
Undeserved grace is all you need. My power is strongest when you are what? Weak. So if Christ keeps giving me his power, I will gladly brag about how weak I am. So it's very important that you, when God cho chooses you, you make up your mind right away that I'm not taking any of the credit for this, that God who cho chose me is going to use me. Uh, another one we saw is when David came in, let's go back there one more time, 1 Samuel and 1 Samuel chapter 17. And this is when, uh, 16, pardon me. And this is when God was choosing David, the prophet Samuel came to the house of uh, Jesse and Jesse had some sons, I think eight sons. And so he said, I'm coming here to anoint someone at your house. Well, that made Jesse feel real good. Praise God. I must have been doing something, right? Somebody's coming to anoint my boys. Well, all seven of them, I think he had eight total. Well, all the others except David passed before Samuel. Samuel, God said, these are not the ones. Now, I got a feeling one of the reasons why he chose David is because David knew he couldn't do something, you know, in the natural. And that he would be one that would give God all the glory. See? And so here, he, wait, he, he asked a very important question, verse 11, and Samuel said to Jesse, are here all your children? So you have to write, ask the right question sometimes because other than that, the David, David would have been out there keeping sheep today. So what happened is he asked the question, he said, yeah, I got one more, but he's young, he's, he's keeping sheep and so forth and so on, doing menial tasks for the household. Well, he said, go bring him in here. And once he brought him in, God spoke to Samuel and said, this is he. And he took the oil and anointed him. Now, once he anointed him, he had no outward proof that this worked. He had no proof that this worked. How did he know to anoint David? By the Spirit of God. Once he did it, how did he know it was done? By faith. He just carried out the will of God. Right there on that spot, he didn't see anything. I can guarantee you, David, there was no, David didn't go in the corner and pick up a chest of drawers. You know what I mean? I mean, he, he didn't do anything. Samuel left, knew it was done. And I'm saying, once you get saved, born again, baptized in water and filled with the Holy Ghost, it's on you. You don't be trying to, uh, 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 trying to feel something. Oh, can't you feel it, Pastor? No. No, I can't. No, you got it sitting in that chair looking at me you got what I got watch this and we've got what Jesus has right now and the more you act on it the stronger it becomes it's not that it's increasing in strength it's increasing in getting through you now this anointing is powerful because I saw in First Kings, at the Second Kings chapter thirteen, where they threw a man who was dead on the bones of Elijah in his grave, and the man got up and started walking, and he was completely healed. I saw over in Acts, in Acts chapter nineteen, where handkerchiefs were taken from Paul, and the next thing you know, taken put on people who are demon possessed, and they got delivered. This is the same anointing that's on you right now. It's not but one anointing. So the Bible calls it a mystery. Say mystery. 
So your brain is not going to know this. The only way it can be done is renewed to the fact that this is in you. You can't feel it. So I'm just saying that as you get stronger and stronger, though, you'll see some things. And sometimes I can feel the heat in my hand and so forth like that. And when you pray for some people, they'll say, well, I felt some heat coming there. That's that anointing taking over and, and, and so forth and so on. All right. Now, in Philippians chapter 4, 13, he says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, he says, that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Are you with that? Let me delve into something here that I want you to hold on. Okay, because we're going deeper. Matthew 4, 4 says something. Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Say every word. Every word. All right, now. So the Bible gives us the truth. The Bible gives us the truth. Now, if somebody reads the Bible and say, I don't believe that. The Bible says, let God be true and every man be a liar. That's found in Romans, Romans chapter three and verse four, I think it is. So I don't care whether you believe this well, I do care, but I don't. I believe it. Watch this. And God believes it. Now I believe it. Okay, you believe it, all right? Okay. Now, over in Matthew chapter 16, this is when Jesus is here up at Caesarea Philippi and he's with the disciples and he asked them, who do they say that I, the son of man, am? It's for a reason. They answered and said, some say you're John the Baptist and so forth. He said, but who do you say that I am? And verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said to him, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. So the Father told him what the answer was. Verse 18, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, what picture is in our minds from that scripture? Because here's the right picture. No, here's the wrong picture. The wrong picture is not you and I sitting up in the church building and the devil trying to beat on the door trying to come in. Okay, Because sometimes he comes in with people. Okay, but that, that's all right. We're putting them out. That is not the picture. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. No, no, no. The right picture is you invading Satan's territory. Watch this. And his gates will not hold you out. Gates often symbolize a seat of authority. It won't hold you out. It won't hold you out. So this is what he said. And then he said this in the next verse. In verse 19, he said, And I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you shall bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed 
in heaven. Now let's look at another translation of that. Let's look at it. Let's try the CEV translation again. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven and God in heaven will allow whatever you'll allow on earth. But he will not allow anything you don't allow. With that verse, who is the one that is responsible for what is allowed? We are. We are. And you will find that when your life has not changed, usually it's because you are not in control of it. You have given control to somebody else. I'll say it again. When your life has not changed, 99.9% of the time, it's because you have not been in control of your life. You have given control to somebody else. Do you remember when in Mark chapter 10, there was a man called blind Bartimaeus. You remember that? Verse 46. And they came Jericho. They came Jericho, Jesus and the followers. And blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when it heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried out more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And when they called the blind man, saying unto him, be of good cheer, arise, he calleth for thee. And he cast away his garments, arose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? And the blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Now that's one. Turn to John chapter five, please. Because I want to I want to I want to take this principle and 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 strap it around you so that you can always judge what's going on. Because we are blaming too many people. We done blame the man, the government. Come on. We done blamed the city of Chicago. We, done, we have blamed everybody except the one we need to blame. And I'm telling you, as long as you're blaming somebody, you're not changing. Let's take that out. Well, they call so to, well, fine then let's go on and now it's up to you. I won't read all of this. Here's a man and this, this uh, John chapter five, this man was sitting beside the pool of Bethesda and you know, every now and then the angel came and stirred up the water and whoever jumped in was first, uh, was healed. In verse five, and a certain man was there, had an infirmity 38 years. Jesus saw him live, knew that he had a long time been in this case. And he said to him, will thou be made whole? And the impotent man began to blame somebody. Well, uh, I have no man and the government didn't send me my check on Saturday <laughs> and so forth and so on. You can always tell when you're blaming somebody, you never move. Try to move and blame. Now, I'm not saying somebody didn't do something. I'm just saying if you get in a certain frame of mind, then nothing changes. See, when, when you change, it's because you believe differently. When you blame somebody, it sends a signal to your subconscious that you have nothing to fix. You have nothing to fix. And your subconscious does not change because it's got to have a reason to change. So 
I want to read that verse again because it's, it's very strong. C-I-V, C-E-V translation of, um, of uh, Matthew chapter 16, 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And God in heaven will allow whatever you allow on earth. But he will not allow anything you don't allow. That's in your finances. Come on. In your body. Come on. In your house. Come on. In your business, in whatever it is. And I said, man, that's powerful. But faith calls for you to be responsible. And so you have to be. That's, that's, that's the fight of faith. And a lot of times we try to put it on somebody else. Now, I'm not saying that somebody didn't do something, but I'm just saying I had to get over it. I remember when I was at IBM, I was doing, you know, and I'd, I, I, was, I was coming out of flying fighters for the military now, and, you know, fighter pilots think they all that in a bag of chips. And so what happened was I came and I joined IBM, and so, I mean, I went through the training just with flying colors, and I was, you know, president of about three of the classes and so forth. So I was, I was tall hog at the trough. And so what happened was now I'm kind of sell, but cells wouldn't come. They wouldn't come, see. They would not come. And I, man, I just, first month didn't come. Now, to cut my salary in half because I'm expected to make the rest up on commission. But when they cut that thing in half, boy, you can feel that thing. I, no, I better say it again. You can feel that when they cut your salary in half. See? And the next thing I know, here I am, see. Now, all kinds of things went through my, my mind, you know, visions of sugar plums, <laughs> you know. Well, they don't like me, you know, us black people, blah, 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 blah. And then pretty soon I woke up. I said, wait a minute. Are you following what I'm saying? Wait a minute. And I have to admit, getting saved helped me to wake up, <laughs> you know. But I said, no, no, mm-mm, it ain't gonna happen. You follow what I'm saying? Man, I caught a hold of that thing, caught a hold of the kingdom and sowing and reaping and so forth, came out number one down in the office, number one. I had to get over all my excuses for not being successful. And when you got the Holy Ghost in you, angels working for you, the blood of Jesus to clean you up when you mess up. Come on, all of that and you gonna make an excuse? <laughs> Satan's job is to not let you take responsibility for your life. That's his job. Don't let them take responsibility for it because if they do, they're gonna tap into God's power. Well, I trust that you were blessed by today's message. Now, this message of understanding the anointing is very, very key, very fundamental to a Christian's growth. Now, let me share with you a powerful point that came out in this uh, teaching today. That once you get born again and filled with the Holy Ghost, the anointing not only is on you, but the anointing is in you. He comes to live in you. Christ himself comes in you. And so now with that, in fact, he enables you to do things that Jesus did. See, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, heal the broken heart, all the things. Jesus raised the dead, cast out demons, heal the sick. All those things he did, not because he was Jesus, meaning a man, man, the son of God, but because he had the anointing on him to enable him to do that. See, he didn't want to do anything without that anointing. And the same should be in our lives, that everything God wants us to do, he wants us to do under his power. And so that anointing is available for anyone who has been born again and you fill with the spirit. You have the anointing on you and in you. A man said this one time, he said, if you have a million dollars in the Bank of New York, and you don't know you have it there all your life, you can die without it. Well, it's the same thing about the anointing. 
A lot of people heard about the anointing, but they don't know what the anointing is. So we've come out with a teaching called Understanding the Anointing. Why? Because you, to operate in it, you've got to know you've got it. You've got to know how the anointing is released, what it does, because it does the absolute impossible. Look at what God has done with me. I came here to the city with $200 and the anointing. Praise <laughs> God. Now, we are preaching almost a billion people on a weekly basis. I'm talking about, look what God has done, even in the city of Chicago and other places. So he did it through the anointing. So I'm teaching you what the Holy Spirit has taught me. And he's now telling me to get you that anointing. Because first thing people say, well, you know, I don't have enough schooling or, you know, I've been in locked up and been, been incarcerated for 20 years. So what? Doesn't make any difference. When you get born again, everything resets. When the anointing comes on you, the impossible can be done. Powerful teaching, understanding the anointing. Well, this is Bill Winston saying we love you and keep walking by faith. Today's series, Understanding the Anointing, is available on CD, MP3, DVD, or MP4. Let this dynamic teaching reveal to you how the burden-removing, yoke-destroying power of the anointing will flow in your life and equip you to do the greater works God has called you to do. Order this must-have series today. Well, hello. I have written a new book. It's called Revelation of Royalty. Now, this book was written because many Christians have not been receiving the divine inheritance because they really don't know their identity in Christ Jesus. They really don't know who they are. I'm talking about in the eyes of God not talking about uh, your relatives or, or the boss man or whatever, but who you are in the eyes of God because your image affects everything. It affects how high you climb. It affects how rich you become. It affects all of that. And nobody really can affect that but you. Now, what we do is we allow other people to call us names or put us in certain positions and we take on that identity. But God is telling you, who you really are. He sees you as royalty. He sees you as one of his family. It is the richest and wealthiest family that has ever been known uh, to mankind. You are in that family if you're born again. Now, this book will help you. It'll help you identify who you are, what you have, and how to get it. We have been missing out on our inheritance, and that's wrong. We want you to get what God says is yours. The first step to it, change your image. Go and understand who God says you are and be that. Praise God. Well, this is Bill Winston saying we love you and keep walking by faith. The mission of Bill Winston Ministries is to preach the gospel of the kingdom throughout the world. Thank you, Bill Winston Ministry partners and viewers for your continuous support of the Believer's Walk of Faith broadcast. The Believer's Walk of Faith is paid for by Bill Winston Ministries partners and viewers. Now remember, you need faith to get to your destiny. So don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification bell so that you don't miss any of our videos. This is Bill Winston. I love you and keep walking by faith.